So, um, uh, Monica and I are co-presenting today, and so we're recognising the people for me um, from the Bundjalung Nation and um, Monica from the uh, Nunganwal. And we also recognise their custodianship and their uh, past and um, current leaders. And we recognise their connection to country and um, what they're teaching us. And we recognise other nations and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who've joined us today. Thank you. So the title today is Cooperative Inquiry, an innovative research approach accessible to all in academia and industry. And um, as I said, um, this is a co, this was Monica going to present this, but she's convinced me to have a little bit of a say as well. So I've got a dual role here of introducing Monica and having a bit of a say. Um, so welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's great to see each other, everybody, and catch up with some people we haven't seen for a while. So it's really nice. Um, the aims of today, just quickly, we'll go over that. Um, just emphasize, you know, the reason for this this work. What what can you do when you can't do your normal stuff? Um, cooperative inquiry. Uh, as a research methodology, what is it? What's the international network of cooperative inquirers? And using it as a uh, way to solve problems and be creative. And then the plans for expansion. And then Monica is going to run you through a, a bit of a workshop style um, stage one of um, a cooperative inquiry. Uh, I might just so what I um, wanted to do firstly is just reiterate as why this is now a dual presentation. Um, originally it was going to be talking about cooperative inqui inquiry as a research methodology, but because we've had so much success with um, using it as a creative problem solver, um, particularly with, this is in particular case with students, that we thought we'd reflect on that and put Put that within the presentation. Um, so hence just explaining, I'll, I'll take on some of that role of explaining that um, process. Um, I'll introduce Monica now. I hope she's caught her breath and feeling okay. So Monica Short is a senior lecturer and social science researcher at Charles Sturt University and um, works in the School of Social Work and Arts. She coordinates the International Network network of cooperative inquirers and in 2020 she received the Australian and New Zealand social work and welfare education and research field university collaboration award that's a big award um, she's also one of a group of recipients who received um, a Charles Sturt University excellence awards award and in 2016 Monica received the Australian New Zealand social work welfare research field placement recognition award for champion innovative models for research. And I can attest that Monica's ability to bring people together and to build them up is outstanding. Monica, are you right to yep. go from here? I'll control the um, slides if you just want to nudge me. So if we can go on to slide seven. Thank you, Robin. And uh, Robin, I have so much admiration for you and your work, and it's just an honour to be presenting alongside you. Hello, everyone. I'm very curious, has anyone here done any sort of participatory uh, research in the past? And if so, what have you done? Some hands are going up. Leslie, I saw your hand go up. What, what have you done? Well, I've done lots and I would use a method in a cooperative sense. So sometimes we've used a trial, sometimes we've used um, an audit of records, but we do it in a cooperative way. Sometimes we've used action research, which is really probably fairly close to a cooperative inquiry. But I think particularly for those of us who are placed rurally or remotely, if you're not working cooperatively with your clinicians or with your community, you might as well forget it because you, you have to do that. And not 
not as a compulsion, but as an appropriate engagement that you have as a researcher with your community. Yeah, well said, Leslie. Thank you. And Megan, you've got your hand up. What have you been doing? Um, yeah, so I have done some research um, working alongside children and young people in different ways. So I've done some action research and in my PhD, I worked with five young people as co-researchers. So we went together and explored policy practices and observed a whole lot of policy people. So that was really exciting. And um, we've done some co-creation work as well. Um, and at the moment, I'm doing some research co-design with some young people as well. Oh, congratulations. Beautiful. Now, I can't see any hands up, but I can see Louise. You're in the audience. Louise Whitcar, a big cheer out to you as well. Thanks for being here, everyone. Okay, so quite a few people, it looks like, have most probably had some sort of experience. And that's really helpful because I'll, I won't have to go through the full basics. But if I say anything that doesn't make any sense, can someone give a call out to me and I'll, I'll slow down and explain it in detail for you. So before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge the amazing people who have taught me everything I know. Um, firstly, a big call out to Robin and everybody at the University Centre for Rural Health. It's been an absolute joy to partner, particularly with the student-led rural focus cooperative inquiries. Um, but to be a partner with you guys on what I think is really important research. So thank you so much. The International Network of Cooperative Inquirers are also beautiful. Hey, this is Ben Wilson again. Um, I'm really well, thankful again, again. to um, um, part of that. I've tried to log back into my um, really done research projects across um, my five countries. Very thankful to be working for Chester University. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge the um, student now, project, 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 project. Um, that we've got partners with Southern Cross University, University of New England, and University of College Cork Island. So can if we can go to the next slide, please. Thanks, Robin. So does anybody, has anyone besides Robin and Louise Whitaker heard of Cooperative Inquiry? And what have you heard? It's Joe here. So um, I've heard through Louise Whitaker, who is a, a fantastic advocate for this approach. Wonderful. Um, full of enthusiasm and energy about it. Um, and uh, yeah, it just sounds incredibly freeing and um, creative uh, way of thinking, thinking with others. Thinking. Yeah, I agree with what Louise and, and what you've just said. So, brilliant. Anyone else? I think we can just oh, okay. say that Louise is a bit yeah. of a mover and a shaker because she's got me interested as well and we're doing a little project together. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So, oh, that's good. Others, any others? Peter, you should pipe in and say what you're doing. Yeah, I need to unmute. I'm from UCRH as well and currently involved in the um, U Cooperative Inquiry led by Monica um, and the group of students from all around the workplace, really. Um, so, yeah, I look, I, I've got to say I'm relatively new to Cooperative Inquiry. I can certainly understand the... The premise of it but the um the, the sort of the term and the workings of it this is the first time i've involved been involved in a project um dealing specifically with this methodology good on you for joining in and being courageous leslie did you have your hand up again were you coming in? uh yes yeah, some of the work that i'm involved in at the moment on birthing on country is being done cooperatively with aboriginal leaders in a variety of communities That's cool. which is stunning but it's, it's probably not in the way you would understand it in a sense of I don't understand the methodology, but it's cooperative. It cannot be done without their leadership. And it's that cooperation of community leaders who want to regain birth on country in their area, working with researchers together to do something that will generate evidence and help persuade 
health systems to change the process to enable them to have their birth back in country. How exciting is that? That is seriously good. Okay, so on that lovely note, I'll come in and explain what is cooperative inquiry. Well, it's the nice thing about cooperative inquiry, it is a research methodology that's free and it's accessible to everyone. Industry sectors, um, industry, health sector, the academia, people who are living with disabilities, so people receiving services, um, and, and people who are studying, like really anyone can use this. And we've been able to use it in a very diverse way. It doesn't matter whether you're in government, NGO, um, not-for-profit, academia. What happens is, is that anyone who wants to share a story and wants to do it in a systematic way can use cooperative inquiry to help uh, achieve that. So cooperative inquiry involves going through four phases. The first phase is that you establish the focus area and research team and you begin to develop your key ideas. It doesn't have to get any harder than that. And in this phase, you usually start doing things like thinking about what sort of research question would you like to answer as a group. The idea is that you throw around a lot of, um, lot of possibilities. And the idea is that we're looking for a spectrum of thinking rather than consensus, because we want to be able to understand something in a, in a comprehensive way rather than in a, in a singular way. In phase two, you discuss and reflect on the focus and collect resources. So again, that doesn't have to be particularly hard. It's about taking advantage of what's around you. For some of us, we have access to fantastic library facilities, but not all of us have that. But we can still collect what's coming across our desk. We can notice what's out in the news. We can notice um, anything that's in the public domain, um, unless we have ethics approval. In phase three, we become immersed in the topic. We agree on and take action. Now, cooperative inquiry doesn't have to be action focused. Um, there are participatory action research, like feminist participatory action research, but it does have the option of choice. So you can choose your action to be, be a participatory kind of activity, or it can actually be an action where you're actually trying to make social change. And then in phase four, you reflect on actions and refine focus. And in phase four, you might decide to go and cycle over the information and data that you're collecting, or you might decide to finish and how you're going to publicly share that information. Because my experience is academia, usually publicly sharing means um, journal articles. But it doesn't have to be that. It might be a presentation to a staff meeting or I know people put a pamphlet together for a health department. So you can you can use it in whatever way that works best for you. The thing I really love it is for us within health and within the professions um, and, and the human services, what we can do is use cooperative inquiry to take our practice wisdom the things that we've, you know, got a professional opinion about and convert that into theory, into uh, public knowledge that can help others. And I think there's something really important in collecting that information. Um, next slide, please. Now, it's really important that whatever research we do, that it's done as an ethical process. And cooperative inquiry tends to fit, when we look at it, the ethical kind of spectrum, uh, tends to fit in the nil to negligible risk. Uh, whenever an inquiry fits in that nil to negligible risk, you don't need ethics. And that's because um, it tends to fit in there because we tend to work with the material that's in the public domain. We tend to work with material that, um, um, you know, doesn't place people at risk because um, we're using our own material. And everybody who is involved in the inquiry is an author. Um, so it's quite similar to order ethnography um, and other kind of reflexivity type of methodologies where people reflect on, you, on your own knowledge. 
uh, next slide. Is there any questions so far about that? Okay. Now, can I just ask? Sorry, yes. can I just ask a question about ethics? I say okay. this because I chair an ethics committee, no. so I'm, I'm very. Yeah, if if you are wanting to share information that changes people's behaviour, if you are, perhaps what you're doing is not accessing material that is of sufficient scale that requires people to give you permission to access it. When you're saying you're only accessing that in relation to your own material, perhaps that will help. But if you're wanting to really shift the system, you do need to sort of perhaps move to another level, which does require ethics permission to get hold of data. Is that not correct? Yeah, that's correct. So I'm on an ethics committee as well. I'm on a health ethics committee. And, um, and that's absolutely correct. So for example, if your project falls into the other domains that are in that spectrum, can everyone see the circles? I'm conscious it looks small. So yeah, no, it's good. Oh, it's good. So there's yes. there's kind of three domains there. And I'm sorry, I skipped it so fast um, just because we've got limited time. You've got the high risk and you definitely need ethics for that. So, for example, if you were engaging on a high risk topic and you were using material that um, involves a third party, then you would definitely need to go and get ethics. Um, then you've got your low risk. Um, and that's where you most probably could need ethics. It's always hard without seeing a project to know whether you actually need ethics or not. Um, and in that case, if in doubt, I always suggest to people to go, go to an ethics committee. Um, usually there's an ethics committee officer or a chair or someone you can talk to and say, does this project need to go through ethics? Um, and then if it's in the nil to negligible risk, then you won't need ethics. Um, so I'll give you an example. Right now we're working on a project where we've got a group of people who are reflecting on what the literature says. And then they're bringing into that um, their own observations. The majority, if not 100% of everything that they're working on is in the public domain already. So because it's a reflection on literature, um, yeah, like a scoping review or something similar, you, you wouldn't go and get ethics or something like that. But at the same time, if I was, for example, doing a cooperative inquiry, um, maybe with, um, uh, maybe with a group of people who were, um, living with intellectual disabilities yeah. and looking at how um, um, how they've been um, um, you know experiencing abuse over the last 10 years then you would need to go and get ethics. Does that help answer the question? There's Thank you that was lovely yeah no that's very useful thanks. Okay um, so yeah if we move to the next slide so just in terms of uh, quickly, I won't go into as much details now, but we are part of Robin and I um, and Louise, who's here as well, are all part of a, a network, the International Network of Cooperative Inquirers. And if you Google us, you'll find us. And there's a lot of information on there that you're very welcome to access. Um, the only thing we ask, all our stuff is Creative Commons, including this presentation, the only thing we ask is you please acknowledge us for the, the work, um, if you borrow any of the ideas. Um, and we hope you do. They're there for you to use. Um, so if we go to the next slide, and I'm going to hand over to Robin. Thanks, Monica. So this is where um, it's a case study of, of cooperative inquiry in practice. Um, so we were going along happily in 2019, making ourselves the subjects, as Monica's described. And, um, you know, we weren't really aware that the world was going to, you know, was heading to it for a massive change and thanks to COVID. So one of um, my immediate pressures was the cancellation of student placements. 
you know, there was there was a lot of work done about um, can we bring students here? What are the risks? Um, you know, will sites even accept them? So um, particularly for social work students, um, there was probably in the sites they were heading to, there were probably high risk um, people that they'd be working with. So a lot of those placements were cancelled. So what happens when placements are cancelled? It means there's no graduation. It, you know, and that's really impactful. Young people were impacted enough. So, um, you know, that that diagram there on the on the slide, it looks a bit messy and it I don't think it quite represents how our brains were trying to figure this out. So we were, you know, thinking, what can we do? How can we adapt? Can we experiment? Can we lean on friends? What can we do? Can we bring the students together? How can we do that? So we weren't quite sure, but we thought cooperative inquiry may be a way to do this. So in 2020, um, we we schemed and and you know found ways to ensure that the students um, could undertake a placement within a, a research. Um, area and um, they would comply with all their assessment and curriculum requirements. So we kicked off the first student-led cooperative inquiry in 2020. Uh, because UCRH was supporting it, um, we really had to ensure that those students had a very strong rural focus and that uh, did determine um, a focus of their question when they developed that up. Um, so that was pretty exciting, but we had to learn a lot as well. But on reflecting for this presentation, we didn't realise just how many positive outcomes um, have come about. Not only did we get these students through in 2020, another group in um, 2021, and we've commenced our third group for 2022. Um, so the, the last two groups have completed their um, placement via this research project and have graduated. But we're listing some of those outcomes that, um, you know, were part of, uh, part of what has been developed. In the first year, we developed up a whole lot of resources um, for students to support them when they're taking on research. And they're on that website Monica's talking about. Um, so we've enhanced that um, InSync website. We just built on the collaboration of the universities and um, you know, the, the people that were already cooperative inquirers jumped on this, supported students to be part of it. Um, and that included our international reach. So we were working with people from other countries, New Zealand, Canada and Ireland um, so they're all quite interested and Ireland um, has had the uh, capabilities to join in these groups. What it does mean though for the students, they have to be very mindful of when they meet um, because for them, their normal time in Australia is sleeping time in Ireland. Um, so that's <laughs> been a very um, broadening experience for them as well. Um, it's developed um, distributed leadership qualities in the students. Um, and then the tangible outcomes, we've, we've had first group had their um, first paper published, and Monica will talk a little bit more about that. The second group has a paper under review, um, um, and they've also presented at an international conference. So it's quite significant for a 20-week placement, um, each, each group. Um, and... Um, we've also had um, one of the students from the first group is now working in Broken Hill, and we know that that uh, rural focus really encouraged her to take that position up, and she's um, strongly involved in this third group now. So we're seeing some cyclic positivity, um, and it's just enhanced. And I think Monica and I were talking last night What's also happened, um, I think the, the 
the academics from the universities have grown in confidence about this because it was challenging and they've grown in the knowledge of how it can support the students. So their support of the students um, is even uh, much more polished. Um, I think I've covered off everything. Monica, do you want to just talk about the um, articles? So just um, continuing what Robin has just said so beautifully is what happened at the time, there was a number of colleagues who came together. Louise Whitaker was one of them. Erica Russ was another one with Robin, but there was a whole group of colleagues that came together, Joanne and Carmel overseas in an island. And what was really exciting was this kind of generation of the most wonderful, inspiring ideas. The time I was a little bit nervous, could we really make this happen? But people kept talking me and saying, yes, we can, yes, we can. And so a number of universities came together. The first on the left-hand side on the screen, you can see the first journal article that um, that was drafted and we're very excited because it, it, it's been published um, and that talks about the experiences of social work students undertaking a remote research-based placement during a global pandemic. Now I'm really thrilled by what those students and um, the colleagues supporting them achieved because what it did was it gave voice to a very um, you know, a very complex, uncomfortable experience of, you know, having to pivot your placement quickly, having situations where, you know, for one person, their placement was actually cancelled. Um, and so they, they came to us because of that kind of awkwardness, because the service wasn't able to provide anymore because of COVID. Um, but what it actually did is it gave voice to people who wouldn't have had a voice and they put out what they were experiencing like it was like a bit of a documentary like what they were experiencing to the public domain and really um, it was really interesting to see how um, they started to value things like valuing a placement in in a different way um, how they really valued supervision um, how they valued connecting with each other based on the success of that that great initiative and thank you to the wonderful colleagues who involved and included me in that project so fortunate to to be part of it because I learned a lot through it um, out of the success of that placement that led us to the to run it again a, a, a student-led rural focus placement again and this came in in 2021 we've got a draft article that's before a journal so you know please god hopefully it will get accepted the reviewers will um, look favorably upon it but regardless um one of my colleagues talks about this is that you know you submit a journal to a journal article if it's accepted you celebrate if it's not accepted we still celebrate we fix it up and we send it somewhere else. And that's very much the plan for this second article. Hopefully we'll be in it. It's been accepted and we'll celebrate that way. But um, this one's very much looking about the impact of rural advantage and disadvantage, but from a student voice and in the literature and generally in the research projects that I've engaged with, um, rural advantage and disadvantage is not considered from a student perspective at all. Uh, it's a, quite a gap in the literature. So if we go to the next slide, so what's next? Um, and don't get excited if you're thinking, oh, it's the end of the presentation. It's not the end of the presentation yet because <laughs> um, we're actually going to give you a taster of cooperative inquiry. But what's next? Well, we're hoping that the student-led rural focused cooperative inquiry will be able to move into an international domain bigger than what it is now. Currently, we've got two countries involved. We've got Ireland and Australia, um, but we're hoping that it will expand. Uh, we're starting to move towards making it multidisciplinary. Up to now, the students have been all social workers, but we think that um, there's value in having a multidisciplinary conversation and, and about students being able to engage with each other from different disciplines, because when they move into the workplace, that's what's going to be their reality. Um, and we'd also like to do some longitudinal thinking about 
the impact of the projects. We've already got um, some very lovely feedback. Um, one of the students that we're aware of is very much working in rural Australia. We know that without projects like this one, a lot of students, um, whether they um, live in rural Australia or they study in rural Australia, a lot of students actually um, leave rural Australia for the cities once they've, they've qualified. But we have got the situation of knowing that somebody has is staying in rural Australia, has already got employment, um, and they're about to finish their studies and that they're going to, um, and then we know that it has been a really positive impact. But we wanna see what impact it's been for the other students as well. And Robin, do you want to add to that? Because I've just realised I've spoken to your slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> perfect. That was perfect. Thank you. I, I think from our point of view at the University Centre for Rural Health, um, uh, really nurturing that multidisciplinary um, experience for students is um, something we're aiming for strongly. Um, we did have... Uh, some Irish OT students um, think that they were going to start this most recent project, but for there's a number of reasons why that doesn't work out. And one of them is that a social work student placement is much longer than an OT student um, placement. So there's some logistics there and there's, there's greater commitment um, that would have to be given by those students. So we'll work through those barriers with time. I noticed Louise has got her hand up. Louise? Just thought I'd add my two cents worth because I was one of the, the people who was involved with the, the first project. Um, I had a student with me on placement. I was doing a little research project and she came and worked alongside me. Um, and that was that was fabulous for me. And, and I think it was also good for her. It was a, um, something about suicide prevention in Lismore. Uh, the thing that was really interesting is once we linked into the broader group so that she could be talking to other students who are also in, in research placements, um, it, it was really reassuring and brought a richness for her because she'd been quite, even though we worked really closely together, to actually um, to have another student being able to, you know, they actually met as students, just the group. We would meet with them for a period of time, then the students would meet. So it would mean that they could talk about how challenging it was and how isolated it was and what they needed to do. So um, it, it really worked very well working not just one research project, but working across a number of research projects and then students linking together. So, so she she got two actual articles out of that because she got, she got to write a report with me and then she also got an article about the process. And Louise, we wouldn't be here without you. Thank you so much. <laughs> It's wonderful. <laughs> um, I just got to give accolades because what Louise does and did was very much outstanding. Um, and just imagine that student turning up to job, job interviews, interviews now with all that beautiful experience on her mm -hmm. resume. How good would that be? Thank you. So, and likewise. And, uh, I just think what you do is wonderful. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, um, oh, it's my slide. So how do I find out more about Cooperative Inquiry? Well, you could visit our website um, just by Googling or going to that uh, address. You could read the publications on the website. Um, we've got a sample of publications listed there. There's, uh, I run 10 week professional development workshops uh, that's been happening at Canberra Health Services. Um, and yeah, they've um, been encouraging me to, to keep trying to share the cooperative inquiry dream. And there's multiple numbers of us doing it. Louise is sharing the cooperative inquiry dream. Robin is also outstanding and has been sharing the cooperative inquiry dream. Erica Rust, like there's a whole group of us um, advocating for cooperative inquiry in our kind of own ways. But if you wanted to look at some professional development, there is that option as well. And if we go to the next slide. So what we want to do now is invite you to spend about <laughs> 10 or 15 minutes with us having 
an experience of cooperative inquiry and seeing how hard it is. Now, cooperative inquiry, the way we gather the data is we do two things. We record the presentation and we get someone to minute our talk. And what we say and we put our names next to it so it'll have like um just just because louise's name's there it'll have louise and it might it would have then her little story about that beautiful story about the person who was um part of um a student the first student led rural focus project and then it would have robin and then Robin would bring in her comment to how about how she observed it. So it's very much detailed by name. And, and that becomes the, the data that's generated, which we then do um, an inductive thematic analysis, which is a fancy way of just saying we look for the common themes and draw that out from our experiences and bring it into the public domain. So can I encourage you all to join with me and Robin and Louise and Peter in a cooperative inquiry experience and see how we go. So we're having a little experience of phase one. So phase one, you join your group together and you start to wonder about what would you like to talk about? So in terms of you with your jobs what is the thing that excites you the most and what would you like people to know about your job who would who would like to go first and what you'll find is I'll gradually draw other people who are quiet in but the idea is everybody gets space to speak and it's no guilt research so you don't have to feel guilty about, oh, do I have something to say or not say? You just say what you think. Um, we go slow. You, we have slow TV, slow cooking. We have slow research. We've got plenty of time for everybody to have an opportunity to share a point about what excites them. And then out of that, we start to think about what would we, what would we present? Um, what would we draw together and, and investigate? Who'd like to start us? I'll go first. Um, what excites me about my job um, is very small things like I'm gay and I'm called a research fellow. And for a feminist lesbian, being called a fellow is kind of cool. But also <laughs> mostly... Mostly what excites me is that I I really love to work with lived experience. I think it's it's, it's an extraordinary way for to create social change. And I get to do that lots in research. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, everyone. You don't have to compete with that. You don't have to start with such a great joke. That is brilliant. <laughs> and, um, yeah, the lived experience is really, really important and exciting, I think. So who wants to go next? What excites you about your job? And tell us what your job is as well. Uh, shall I go? Yes, please, I Caroline. don't know. Hi, I'm Carolyn. Um, I have the best job in the world. Um, sorry to all of you. Um, you don't, I do, um, because I'm the immunisation coordinator for the North Coast Public Health Unit. And there is so much possibility in my job that I could quite happily be here talking about immunisation and researching immunisation. And uh, for the next, as long as I live. Um, and sorry to you who might not have my job <laughs> brilliant absolutely brilliant and hello Emily I've just noticed you in there good to see you thanks Monica. I think Joe sorry Emily Joe Longman put her hand up is that right Joe oh sorry oh there you are yeah I did I wasn't sure what the protocol was whether we were just leaping in or putting hands up or whatever zoom protocol <laughs> Whatever um, works for you. 
So I'm just going to say a bit more, I guess, based on uh, Megan's contribution. Um, so I think what one of the many things that excites me about my work is its relevance and how it's meaningful to me and others. And I think there's something really beautiful, isn't there, about doing something that you find meaningful. Yeah. Yes. It's 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 kind of like a virtue, isn't it? A kind of characteristic. I oh. echo that sentiment, Joe. That was going to be what I was going to say very similarly. Oh. It because it I mean that I agree. It's one of the great things about rural and remote health research mm. is it's relevant. We get to actually see and it's timely. We get to see the impact of our research and evaluation and uh, what can come of it. That's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And for those of us who have done research about rural issues, it's very exciting. Really, because um, you can really see how it impacts, you know, on a, a particular community. Um, Oh, I love this. Who's going to go next? Um, my name's Marianne. I'm a uh, clinical educator um, for Southern Queensland Rural Health. And uh, I um, actually not um, uh, substantially involved in research, but I often think uh, I'm a social worker, and I often think social work is is um, commonly about um, you know um, sharing an alternative narrative. And I, what I like about my job as a clinical educator is actually working around an alternative narrative about um, uh, rural and remote practice and sharing that with students. I love that as well. And wouldn't it be exciting to give an alternative narrative about what is great practice in rural Australia? Can you see how it starts to come together? Who yeah. wants to go next? How hard is this? I just think it's great fun. You get to talk about something that's really important to you and then you get to be able to share it. And you can think deeply about it as well and, um, and do it in a warm and gentle way. Who, want, who wants to go next? Yeah, I'm going to jump in. I'll probably regret it. Um, so mm -hmm. my name's Peter. I'm a clinical educator as well in social work at uh, UCRH in Lismore. Um, I just think, to be honest, and this will sound almost sort of cliched, but the thing I love most about my job is the kid, well, students that I work with. I shouldn't say kids. Anyone under 40 to me is a kid, but... <laughs> The, the students who I work with, um, because I just feed off their infection, it, you know, it, their, their enthusiasm and their sort of drive and their want to learn. It, it can be really infectious and it actually feeds into me as well. And, and, and that's the thing I love the most. I love working with these, these students and their, um, you know, just, just that sort of really wide open eyes you have when you're first sort of about to graduate and, wanting to go into the field. I, I just find that stuff really, um, you know, infectious and inspiring as well. And I'm now curious, what do other people think about that? Do you have something that's inspiring and infectious in what you're doing? How would you like to respond to Peter's point? Well, I think it's interesting that um, infectious is a word that comes up given Caroline's perfect job. <laughs> Can I go back it, It's really fascinating to me that we're talking from a social work point of view. The Most of the students who come to UCRH, for example, are from medicine. I would okay. love to hear that medical graduates or medical students are getting the same enthusiasm and that are being taught in the same way because that's what's valuable. The, the really good GPs, the really good surgeons in rural communities are ones who absolutely love the community. We actually have to be teaching 
the medical students in the same way that clearly those people who come from social work are doing. We need to get medicine to do the same thing. Um, Leslie, that's a perfect segue to me. <laughs> so uh, I'm Natalie and I'm a, um, a doctor, but also um, a part of UCRH and I support the Western Sydney Uni students to do MD oh. projects. Um, and so I guess, um, you know, hopefully our educators are engaging um, with the medical students in that same way. I think they are, particularly our GPs. I think they really do engage. We've got some great GP educators and also okay. hospital educators. But my role is to also bring in that opportunity for research, like you, you know, have done with a social work student around cooperative inquiry, but to bring in, um, M so Western Sydney students doing MD research projects, similar to the community research, but individual projects. Um, and so obviously um, I also have the perfect job because I get to um, meet um, a whole lot of different people who are interested in research across the LHD and then share their enthusiasm with the young people. So, so I've got both the beauty of working with other supervisors and other people, um, you know, that have something to offer and some local learning and knowledge and also sharing it with, like Peter said, with the young people that have that energy and a unique perspective. It's not without its challenges, but yeah, it is really, um, really great to be able to um, work across such a diverse um, area. And because my clinical work is very narrow in sexual health and HIV, um, to be able to then have this opportunity to be in all these spaces across education and across all aspects of health is really exciting. Great, thank you. And you've got me curious and wondering now, because I'm thinking, wouldn't it be exciting to have doctors and social workers doing a cooperative inquiry and expl and expressing <laughs> where their similarities and differences are and what's making them enthusiastic about wanting to work in rural Australia? Do you know what I mean? You just yeah. you start talking and you can start to see someone else's perspective. Mm. And so you become enriched. One of our wonderful colleagues, Carmel, talks about cooperative inquiries about both generating knowledge, but also it's about regenerating us. Um, so we expand as we listen and learn from each other. And, um, and the research becomes richer. Like we get, um, yeah, really rich understanding of what's going on and how can we put ourselves in someone else's um, situation and how can we grow through that? Um, and I, th I think all that adds weight to the argument for, you know, multidisciplinary yes. cooperative inquiry. Nicely yeah. said. Absolutely agree. Yeah. Absolutely agree. yeah. We most probably have time for just one more person. I'm sorry. <laughs> Who would like to go <laughs> next? It's lovely seeing all your faces. Hi, it's Ken here. I'll just turn on my video. Hello, everyone. Um, Hi, Ken. Yeah. Is it Ken or Kenneth? Sorry. Oh, Kenneth. Or what Ken. do you prefer? Oh, either. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I, um, my role is uh, manager of patient experience, co-design and inclusion with the organisation. So I work a lot with um, people with lived experience. And next week, I, I have a wonderful opportunity to work with um, uh, colleagues who have a lived experience um, using the principles of co-design in their um, change processes that they're involved in um, in the organisation. I, I think um, someone touched on earlier, maybe Robin, about you know um, things like patient information and now um, and and the people who are doing the work around uh, health literacy and that sort of thing. They're hev heavily involved, um, but. Uh, yeah, so I'm very excited about that. We've got um, it's it's and we're kind of using. I suppose a bit of a um, cooperative inquiry process. Next week, we've got four conversations scheduled um, with about 10 people in each of those conversations. So very much looking forward to that. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. All the best with it. Thank you. Ken, are you still with the LHD? Yes. Great. Wow, that's exciting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, just over the road on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll look out for you.
Great. So, Robin, how did what what are your observations? Of, I thought that was brilliant. Oh, quite excited with that conversation because that inspires me because um, often when uh, systems or processes are in place, there's comfort in that and um, nudging that creates the discomfort. Um, but having like-minded people who are happy to nudge away, um, I think that's an important part of giving us purpose. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Nicely said, beautiful. So on that note, we're going to wrap up. There's our references. Uh, feel free if you want to know anything more about Cooperative Inquiry to talk to Robin and me, obviously. But I hope Peter and Louise don't mind me dobbing you in as well. But we have mm -hmm. two other colleagues here that you can talk to as well. Um, and we would love to hear from you. And we wish you all the very best with your best jobs in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you for, yeah, taking the time. I really appreciate everything the centre does. You do outstanding work. Very thankful to Robin and the opportunity to, um, um, to do research with her. And, yeah, thank you for listening. Thanks, Monica. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Monica. Bye. Thanks, guys. Um, so this has been recorded and you can get the slide show if you um, want that. I'm not quite sure what the process is, but we'll I'll follow up and let you know. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.